Hi, everyone, and welcome to day two of International Careers Week. We are so excited to have John Hemingway with us. He is a writer and filmmaker educated in New York, Switzerland, Massachusetts, and at Princeton University. His work has focused on nature, science, history, biology, biography, and American West, the Middle East, and Africa. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. It's a, a delight to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> so I should talk to you about myself now um, and my, um, uh, my career. Uh, <clears throat> I have to preface this by saying uh, that a lot of my career has been based on luck and, um, and uh, sheer serendipity. Uh, I'll give you some some examples of that. But the the point of my address and the point of our time right now is to help you maybe consider some of the routes that I've taken uh, in in uh, uh, developing uh, plans for your own career. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm going to make uh, uh, two things of, of paramount importance uh, from the start. One is that writing has been at the very core of everything I've done. Um, it has informed me as both a, obviously a writer, but as a filmmaker. And number two, never burn bridges. Um, and um, I've had many opportunities to burn bridges. Uh, and um, <clears throat> always remember that the everything comes around. So, I <clears throat> I got out, out of college um, a long time ago. Uh, wait a second, there's something, uh, there's a prompt asking me to talk in Arabic. No, um, don't worry about that, John. <laughs> Just keep okay. going. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I didn't think you want me to speak to you in Arabic. <laughs> so um, I got out of college uh, uh, too many years ago. I'm not even going to tell you when. Um, and... I had fallen in love with Africa at the age of 16. I'd been on a schoolboy expedition there, and I had done some various adventuresome things during my college summers. I hitchhiked across the Sahara Desert. Um, I, uh, I worked in the mines in South Africa. I, uh, um, I traveled and saw incredible things. And being in love with Africa prompted me to want to go back there and write a book. And I was extremely lucky um, because I got a book contract for pennies. I mean, I was offered an advance of absolutely no money at all. The idea was that I was going to go to Africa and interview all the last uh, settlers there and find out how they were going to cope with the new Africa of independence. And um, and that was the theme of the book. Um, and I spent six months traveling all over Africa. And um, and at the end, I went home and I wrote a book and it got published. It was called The Imminent Rains. And I'm telling you this because, because of that book, a friend of mine from college uh, who was a cameraman at ABC Sports took that book around and showed it to a producer there. And I got my very first job. Well, not quite my first job, but my first important uh, job uh, at ABC Sports um, to writing the series. Now, I, I didn't know anything about writing for television. Um, I didn't even know the front end from the back end of a camera. So I, I started off in a very lowly position as a production assistant. And uh, essentially my job was to go on location and to provide sandwiches for the crew. Um, but in doing that, learning the language, watching how things go, and, and just being a mimic. And that's, that's another thing I ought to tell you about. Being a mimic is really important. And so I learned just by watching. Um, I didn't have a film degree. I didn't have anything in, in the way of uh, credentials to get me this job. But I got this job. And I ended up writing um, 
several hundred um, shows for ABC Sports, the American Sportsman. Uh, the narrator was somebody called Kurt Gowdy, and um, and and then that morphed into me becoming going on location, and I started going uh, doing a location work as a lowly production manager, but I. I had some advantages over the producer, especially in Africa. I knew my way around Africa. I spoke the language. And I suddenly started, um, and on the basis of that, and on the basis of, uh, we made a film about the largest elephant in Africa with John Houston, who was a very famous director. And John and I became really good friends. And on the basis of that, I started making films of my own. And uh, it went on from there, and it's it took me to England, uh, where I worked for Survival Anglia, uh, Anglia Television, for four years. That took me all over the world, uh, you know, on this ancient ship in the middle of the Indian Ocean, um, doing a film about that, and getting arrested in and uh, put in jail in Somalia and in Yemen, and um, all these great adventures. And um, and I did that for four years. And finally, I, I kind of got homesick for America. I came back to America, started making um, industrial films to keep myself um, alive. And then I got a job working at PBS um, uh, doing doing something called the Brain Series that became the uh, that was a huge success um got lots of awards and then i went and did the mind series i did that was great success as well i got the emmy for that i'd gotten the emmy for abc sports and eventually my my career just snowballed and um and you know i started making my first national geographic film way back uh during survival days about the origin of humanity and then um, I started making more and more um, films of uh, for National Geographic. Um, I did a big film about uh, evolution, which was a fascination for me. And ultimately, I did uh, um, a sequence of um, of National Geographic films, um, which um, again have won a lot of awards. But the awards are not the point. The point is that I was. Um, engaged um and, and during that time i wrote six books um so what what comes out of it why is it important for you to know this a is um, for a while and not forever and certainly not now i became kind of an indispensable factor for national geographic and making films especially about elephants so i knew a few things I knew the right people, and I helped in raising the money for those films. Um, and I could write them and direct them and produce them. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> and I, I guess, I mean, so what is the secret of, of my success? Well, it's luck. It's being in the right place at the right time. It's never saying uh, go to hell to anybody I've ever worked with before. And uh, that's been an important factor, and it's helped me out enormously. It's also, uh, it's it's been so important to write, uh, and to, um, uh, to do that. And I have found, and I now teach, from time to time at MSU, uh, in Bozeman, and and what I've d d uh, discovered there is that. The great gap in learning and in producing films. I meet a lot of people who are technically so far above me, um, I can't even begin to tell you. And <clears throat> But they can't write a declarative sentence. And that is going to be the, the, um, the anchor to their career unless they can get over that. Uh, you have to be able to express yourself in short little bites um, and make it very compelling and tell stories that make people sit up in their in their seats. Um, and that's 
been, if anything has been productive in my life, it's been that. Um, and I could go on about details and so forth, but I think I've exhausted my time limit. Is that correct? <laughs> that was and great. And now I'll take the questions. Yes, absolutely. And while uh, students are typing in your questions, I'm going to ask you one first. Um, can you describe unique challenges and opportunities involved in creating documentaries and films? Um, yeah, the, the first... Um, um, the first challenge is raising money for it. Uh, films are uh, becoming uh, increasingly expensive. Uh, just imagine, I I started my career in the age of film, and I um, I thought uh, the digital thing was not for me, but I changed my mind, and I then became a complete. Uh, uh, you know, um, how, how should I say, booster of of digital films. And it there's huge price savings when you go from film into digital. Um, and But still, uh, keeping a team in the field is expensive. And what you have to do is you have to, A, have helped raise the money, or because that's part of the job of producing, you have to go to people uh, who need a, your film. Uh, guilt is a great thing. I once raised, I, I helped get it, get the nature series started at PBS because um, I went out and I got the first donation from the American Gas Institute that needed a lot of help and they needed greenwashing. And there was no better way to do it than with the nature series. And that's that was at the time a kind of a a good idea. I don't know if it's a good idea anymore, but you have to be inventive and creative about finding the money. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is being in very remote places under uncomfortable uh, conditions uh, with uh, a very very rich group of people uh, is can be a challenge. And all I can say is that. If anything has helped me understand the uh, the family of man, the family of women, it is uh, it is being on location uh, with people of every different stripe in the world, um, and that has uh, helped me keep my mind open to everybody. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, raise the help, raise the money learn how to write and uh, be aware that you're going to be in places with people that under other circumstances, you may not have wanted to share um, a glass of water with, but you will when you make films. We got lots of questions coming in here, John. It's from Hamilton High School. How do you choose topics for your films and books? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, uh, I keep my ears open, um, and I, I am somebody of passion. Um, and as you, you may have guessed, I, I care deeply about the environment. And when I see an opportunity, I, I spring at it and I learn how to articulate that problem, um, in very short words. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, a very good friend of mine was Richard Leakey, who was um, uh, I did a big film with um, at um, Lake Turkana in Kenya. And, um, and we were showing this film in New York at a very prestigious location. And um, he said to me, I said, Richard, what's the next film? And uh, we we sat there and we scratched our head and we said, it has to be elephants. There's a crisis that is happening with elephants. And what was happening is there was this all out poaching um, uh, uh, jamboree in Africa, uh, killing elephants indiscriminately all over Africa. And what I soon learned is that nobody understood the real essence of it. So I came up with the idea. I said, 
Let's look at elephant ivory, supply and demand. The supply was in Africa and the demand was in Asia. We went undercover in Africa. We went undercover in Asia and we put together the little pieces. And I thought it was possibly a story that a lot of people knew. It turned out nobody knew this story. And so we had, uh, we showed it to both houses of Congress. Uh, it was sent around to all the embassies, of uh, the U.S. embassies around the world. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, you know, it was a lead film at CITES where I virtually got into a fist fight a fist fight with people who disagreed with the premise of the film, which was a great compliment to me. And another compliment has been that the film has been copied over and over again. So I don't care if people want to steal our ideas. That's fine. Uh, we think that's impact. So I get ideas by watching. If you read the New York times and you go to page three or four, there's a, Every every day, there's a story that's going to jump out at you and say, that has to be a film. Does that help? Yes. Have you ever felt that your job was dangerous? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I can think of a uh, number of times, you know, obviously when I was on that ancient ship coming down the Indian Ocean, um, and every time we we would stop to get uh, a bag of oranges, uh, we'd be arrested because, uh, you know, people thought we were part of the CIA, uh, which didn't make a lot of sense, but that's, that's what the worry was at the time. But the most recent thing was I did a sequel on the elephant film and we were in the Northeast part of uh, uh, the democratic Republic of the Congo. And, um, uh, it is incredibly dangerous country that uh, uh, these um, terrorist groups were massacring the elephants and using and, um, you know, we discovered using the ivory as collateral to buy arms. And more importantly, on a human scale, uh, they were they were capturing young men um, to. Um, uh, to be child soldiers. Uh, just imagine yourself at age 11 or 12 being told, um, being given a gun and told to sh kill people. And they were capturing young girls as child brides. Um, and we wanted to, to, to make the connection between elephants and that. So we took, uh, we, I decided that we'd fly to a place called Dungu, uh, right in the northeast corner of uh, of the park of Garamba. And we'd go from there and we'd drive on the most dangerous road in Africa, they said, to the border of uh, the South Sudan. And then we'd come back and interview all these people, all these kids. We did that. We were late for our plane. We set off and um, we, you know, it's the darkest Africa, no lights, no help with navigation, no nothing. And we barely made it back alive. So that was a, something that comes to mind as a sort of a dangerous thing. But you know what? It's what it it's what makes me want to go back and back. I I love taking risks like that. So if, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. What country is your favorite to work or make a film in? Well, <laughs> I've, I've worked in, in so many countries and I, for every one of them, I just love. Um, I followed a group of students who wanted to change the world. I went around the world with them and we went from Africa to Asia to all over. Uh, but I have to say it goes back to Africa for me. Um, it is, I love to film in Kenya. I love to film in Tanzania. I love to film in Uganda. And if ever I was given the chance, I would go back into South Sudan. Again, one of the most dangerous countries yet. And I'd love to film there. And I know exactly what I'd want to film. So I, I, my, yeah, I, you know, 
I should keep myself open and say, I'd love going everywhere, which I do, and I'll take a job anywhere. But if if you mention the word Africa, yeah, I'm there. <laughs> How are the communities you worked with in Africa different from communities in the United States? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, and a very interesting question. Um, the um, well, it, it it really depends on where where you go in Africa. Of course, um, I always find the joy of Africa is is working with Africans. Uh, they have an incredible sense of humor um, that reveals itself um in the most awkward times um you know and i i love them for that um i they um you know there's issues in africa and it used to, it has to do with bureaucracy uh but once you overcome the problems of bureaucracy dealing with people in africa is an absolute total joy that doesn't mean i don't like filming in montana I do, um, and uh, and you know the great thing about Montana is that people will tell you their mind, um, and they um, and they all have have great have great stories. Um, I I just love being able to work on a very diverse uh, palette in in my life, so I'm open to working with um, uh, with everybody, but especially in Africa because of that profound sense of humor and um that ability to um uh to help in in ways that other people might not want to help so yes that's how i'd describe it how did you build beneficial relationships all the time with people and organizations you mean organizations like national geographic um and uh PBS and that sort of yes. thing. Yes. Uh, well, I I mean I I I've always thought to myself that what I really want to do is I I everybody I work I work with I want to make a friend, um, and it's you know I think if you just look at at your job in the film industry or in writing and so forth as as just an exercise in 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 um uh, a professional exercise i think you're making a profound mistake um i can list to you all the people i've worked with at uh at national geographic and for the most part a lot of them remain friends and i've always encouraged that friendship some people would say that's not very professional for me it has been very professional and um I ask questions. I am, I am at, they may be interested in me for professional reasons to hire me, but I'm also interested in them to find out why they hired me and where they came from. And so my whole life has been a two way street in, in engaging with the people I work for and with. Uh, and it's, it's friendship. If you just keep it as a professional uh, level, I think you're going to miss out on lots of things and lots of opportunities. What kinds of activities do you have to do behind the scenes for your films? Oh, um, lots. <laughs> uh, you, um, I mean, where where to begin? Um, when you're interviewing somebody, um, you you uh, and particularly somebody who's really kind of nervous about being interviewed. Or, or, um, are are going to hide a secret. Um, you you have to behind the scenes develop a relationship, give them confidence. Uh, you know, tell them the process, um, encourage them. So you work like that uh, with people you interview. Uh, in terms of um, of of. Uh, of other things i mean every film requires an enormous amount of of um, pre-planning pre and pre-planning is key to your success you just can't walk into a situation and 
let the cameras roll and think it's going to work. No, you have to, uh, you know, there's bureaucratic things to overcome. That's, that's number one. Uh, but you have to, I always think you, you have to know the place where you're in. It's um, yeah. if you're going to film somebody, you've got to, you've got to place that person in his or her environment. And, um, and all that takes a lot of walking around and <clears throat> scouting and getting a, a sense of um, the environment. It's really important. Um, so much goes on. I would say that, <clears throat> that for um, every one minute on screen, uh, there are 25 minutes of preparation. Behind the what, scenes. What was the most difficult film you have made in terms of complexity of the content? Well, I think that would have, sorry, it would have to be the brain series. Um, <clears throat> because when we made it, I can't give you the year, but it was in maybe the late 80s. <clears throat> no film, no film series had ever been made about the brain. Uh, and the idea is that uh, if you actually showed a brain on camera, people would be disgusted um, and would probably turn it right off. So uh, we had to create a, a way of looking at the brain that was uh, was alluring and uh, would, would draw people in. So we had to kind of create our own language. And that was what I would call com complex. And how we did that is uh, we looked at what the brain does. And we also looked at what the brain doesn't do. And when it uh, went in, it, in a number, you know, we would find out people who had brain issues. We would take those brain issues to explain what the amygdala was, what the hippocampus was, uh, what the neocortex was. Um, what the cerebellum was, and and through uh, people with deficits in those zones, they would help illustrate what the function of that part of the brain was, and that's so. I would say it, that took a lot of of pre planning, and in that case, every one minute of film probably uh, required sixty minutes of uh, pre planning and thought and discussion amongst the team. What education or pathway should a high school student aspiring to become a filmmaker take today in order to be successful in the field? Learn to write. <laughs> um, if you, uh, um, if you, if you uh, excel in English, uh, you're going to have a head start over everybody else. It also helps to understand geography which is not taught in schools as much as I would like. Um, and of course, history, world history. Um, so those three things are, are vitally important, but also it's to find an area of studies which gives you passion. Let's imagine you, uh, um, you, you fall in love with uh, high mountains. Um, you know, Go crazy about that. Um, talk about it. It, it. You know, spend time with that subject. Climb those mountains. Do do something. So you come back with an expertise in that, and that will help you get going in whatever you know. It'll be the 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 launch pad for your career. Uh, you end up making a film about high mountains. Uh, that's gonna help you make. Uh, films about rivers and uh, oceans and everything else. Ultimately, one will lead to the other. But start with English. Start learning how to speak English. And, uh, um, and, um, uh, and that's, and that's going to make all the difference. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I hope I answered that question. At, um, okay. So how do you effectively raise awareness about subjects? Well, um, you make a film about it. 
uh, um, you write a book about it. Uh, you, um, you, um, you, you, uh, you know, I have a, um, I, I wrote a book about a woman in Africa uh, with a very, very equivocal past. And, um, and this was a woman that nobody in the bigger world really knew about. Uh, but her, her issues are kind of universal issues. And that book is, is now being optioned as a film, a Hollywood film. And, um, and so what I'm saying is that you, you take, uh, you, 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 you find a story that is bigger than just the story. If you meet somebody um, <clears throat> who is um, an elderly person, but who has a great story about his or her community um, and the issues that that person raises are, are really big. Write about that. Make a film about that person, and um, and it will expand and and um, it will get everybody's attention. You know that's what film and books are like a megaphone, and that's what I've spent my life doing using that megaphone. That's where you get people's attention. At this point, what has been your favorite part of your career? would have been the what what is your favorite part of your career oh gosh oh thank you for asking that question <laughs> i've been so lucky uh i i have looked back at uh all these travels i've done for my films for my books um it is um i'll tell you what what really strikes me most of all is uh when you you know you make you make a film it's broadcast it has a certain uh following you know it could be millions of people and so forth but i found that that is you know and then you get phone calls and you get uh ratings nielsen ratings and so forth everybody thinks that's the point of making a film i have discovered that's probably not the point of the film the point of a, making a film is is uh, when you end up showing that film to a group of 18 people somewhere and um and they and and they and you change their minds that to me has been the highlight of my career Cha uh, wa watching people's change their minds about something uh and we and as i needn't tell you we live in a very divided world right now and um and getting people to witness the other side of an argument is so um it is so alluring for uh somebody in the media like myself that's really what makes a huge amount of difference and that's the pleasure of my career what are some of the software applications used in editing your film for instance we use adobe premium to edit films within our video production class yeah, Adobe is really good. Um, um, I'm. Uh, there are all kinds of new uh, of new editing formats right now, and I would defer to some of my team to uh, tell you about them. But um, Adobe is a great start, and I um, I highly recommend it. Um, and it's um, as we say, it's 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 kind of a. Um, the the language of editing universally uh, accepted so uh, that would work in not just in Montana but it would work in uh, nationally and internationally so stick with Adobe whatever you think you're most comfortable with stick with that there are only about three names that really uh, matter and one of those is the one you you're going to latch on to students would like to know where are you from originally. I'm originally from New York, and um, I grew up. I grew up there, but I had an international background uh, starting early. I 
were shipped off to um, a European school at the age of nine. And um, um, and so my life has been sort of pan uh, transatlantic, if you will, or at least it was. And then at the age of 16, I went to Africa and it became, um, you know, centered there. So I, well, I grew up in the, in the East. Um, I ended up moving around a lot and uh, um, it helps uh, to have a second language under your belt. Um, and it, you know, in my case, the third language. So um, that, that's, you know, you can take that away too. So I've been tell, telling you about English um, and how important that is, but also, you know, it wouldn't be such a terrible thing to know Spanish and um, maybe some French um, thrown in. So uh, yeah, my background started in the East Coast. And then I fell in love with, uh, with Montana way back when, and um, I moved my family out here 18 years ago. I, I have a daughter who is uh, at the university back at, back East, and she's 22 years old, uh, but she did all her growing up in Montana. And um, I'm very, very proud of that. And uh, it was a wonderful thing to watch her thrive in this wild and beautiful place. How do you deal with an animal that approaches you while filming? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> how do I? Um, well, uh, first of all, you've got to know that animal. You know, the approach to a, a, a charging lion is very different from the approach of a charging elephant. And you have to uh, understand um, body language. Re it's really important to understand body language. Um, uh, I, um, yeah, I once made a film about the uh, most dangerous snake in Africa, uh, in the world, maybe Black Mamba. And, um, and in doing that, we showed some other films like A Spitting Cobra. And um, so, uh, you know, my, my cameraman uh, had uh, goggles on and, and all sorts of defensive equipment to um, to deal because we wanted to get on slow motion. We wanted to get the effects of a spitting cobra actually spitting at the camera. And um, he did everything right, except that he kept his mouth open in in wonder. And um, so the spitting cobra didn't get go to his eyes and it went straight into his mouth. So that was a mistake. Um, elephants. I've just come back from Africa and um, uh, with uh, some, some people who um, some who were just dead scared of elephants. I've just spent so much time with them and with some of the experts in elephant world is that you can learn very easily how to distinguish a real charge from a fake charge. Um, when an uh, when an elephant comes at you and its ears are going like crazy and it's bellowing and so forth, that's that's a, um, a false charge. And you can stand your ground and film film it until he gets to within about 16 feet and then, you know, think about it twice. But when his ears are back and it comes at you and, and they're not moving and he comes at you at flat out, get back into the car fast. Uh, so every animal you have to you have to know animal language body language um, and then you'll you'll feel much more comfortable in the bush what made you realize that you cared so much for the nature and the environment sorry what what made me uh, yeah what made you realize that you cared so much for nature and the environment <clears throat> well that's a lovely question um you know, I think I was always kind of an outdoors person. You know, I I loved, you know, my, my heart stops when I see high mountains and stops when I'm on the Serengeti. I mean, it's just like, I, I don't see how you could uh, uh, change it. But, you know, I had parents who, who um, um, my mother was sort of, uh, 
uh, part of the bird watching community at an early age, um, and she and she communicated that to me. So um, I can remember going on expeditions with her in the United States, uh, looking for uh, you know all kinds of wonderful uh, birds on the west coast of Florida, for instance. And um, and I think that your parents help, and I just. And in recent years, uh, a fascination with the wild has turned into a determination to protect the wild. And uh, I think that anybody who doesn't realize that um, uh, climate is in a state of of uh, seriously um, uh, serious flux, uh, then you are missing out on you're not looking outside the window. And um, and so, you know, I don't like making films that are preachy, that tell people what to do. I don't make films like that. Um, but subtly, I like to inject a feeling of, of you know, really, uh, I'm really motivated to t tell people that we have to do something vital right now to change things. What role should a young person getting started in film expect to fill in production? Start uh, in a very humble position as a gopher, um, like I did. Uh, don't be ashamed of taking on the most rudimentary uh, job on a film, even though you think you're an extraordinarily good camera operator. Um, that's not how you start off. You don't just suddenly get a job as a camera operator. Um, <clears throat> uh, so much of the of the busy work on a film takes place in um, in the office, on the phone, uh, talking people into you know asking questions, getting information, uh, securing reservations all these you know stupid pieces of work uh that's where you have to begin because you have to know exactly how how it all works because one day you'll be at the top of the heap and um you you want to you want to be a very close friend to the gopher who's getting you the hotel room and who's finding you the car and who's making that interview possible so start at the bottom it's fun I mean, it's not, it's not demeaning in any way. I loved it. I I learned um, the hard way, you know, with my hands. And my last question for you, John, is what advice? What last piece of advice would you give to students looking into filmmaking? Um, really, find a story, you know. Um, Storytelling is one of the greatest attributes of being a human. And um, I lament when I come across people who cannot tell a story properly. And I rejoice when I meet people who can. And stories will, will impact your life, will drive you to do things that you never thought you could do. Um, and... Uh, it is at the center of humanity. Just, just imagine what it was eighty thousand years ago, when people sat around a a, a fire, and um, when they they had the ability to decline and conjugate and and to imagine the future and to tell tell about the past. What did they talk about? They told stories, and we're forgetting that art. Uh, because so much time is spent on these little devices in our hands um, and we let other people tell stories, you tell the story. And that and, and telling stories and telling them well will empower you in ways that you cannot imagine. It will change your career and it will direct your career. Thank you so much, John, for joining us today for International Careers Week. I just want to quickly say thank you to our International Careers Week sponsors at Stockman Bank, Clearwater Credit Union, Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, and Humanities Montana. Thank you so much, John. And thank you. Lovely talking. Yes. Bye, everyone.